Texas Crossroads of North America. Chapter 12, Depression and War. In 1929, my father was employed as a locomotive engineer, recalled Robert Osmond, of the years just before the Great Depression struck. Osmond and his family lived in Temple, a central Texas farming and railroad center. We had a new Overland Whippet Auto. We were buying a home, had money in the bank, and plenty of food and clothing. By 1933, all this was gone except the Whippet. We were living in a rent-free house which bordered the Negro section of Temple. We often had little to eat but oatmeal. We were without electricity and had few clothes. I remember this house well because it had no coverings on the splintery old floors. No one, I'm so sorry, my one pair of shoes had to be saved for winter use and during the summer my feet were constantly bandaged from splinters. I also remember the whippet. We had no money for either gas or tires so it just sat in the shed. <clears throat> it became kind of a physical symbol of the time to me because like some of the humans, it was waiting for a chance to go to work and did not understand why it could not. All it could do was to waste away its productive years waiting and hoping until the inexorable end should arrive. We sold it for $5 in 1939. I once asked my mother who what had caused the depression they talked about so much, considering the fact that neither we nor any of our family were farmers. Her answers may seem a bit peculiar, she said. The bottom fell out of the cotton market. To a person living in Bell County, it was just that simple. The bottom fell out of the cotton market. I was just old enough to remember the physical dep deprivations which... May, my family suffered, he concluded, but none of the physical or psychological trauma. Here are the dates for chapter 12. As the presidential election of 1928 approached, many Texans reflected on the good economic times of the Roaring Twenties. When the state's population had increased by almost 25% to more than 5.8 million in cotton, lumber, truck, and citrus farming, Livestock and oil, gas, and gas fueled the economy apparently more effective, efficiently than ever. By 1929, the state was the world's leading supplier of crude oil, having produced more than 2 billion barrels, and the development of the Houston Ship Channel had made that city the state's busiest port. Electrical appliances, lights, radios, telephones, and plumbing facilities had greatly improved urban life in several Texas cities. Dallas, Houston, and San Antonio were among the most rapidly growing in the country. The number of automobiles which facilitated the move to urban cities, or I'm sorry, urban areas increased to the point that Texans owned one car for every 4.3 residents. Such affluence led to led to talk of Coolidge prosperity after President Calvin Coolidge, 1925 to 1929, and the general fleeing that a permanent cornucopia had emerged in the years after World War I. The two economic dyna dynamas, oil and agriculture, continued to propel the state forward from 1930 to 1945. During these years, however, Texas and the nation faced two of their greatest challenges, the Great Depression and World War II, and the state's inability to act forcefully to combat the ravages of the Depression required the federal government to play an even more significant role than it had in the Progressive Era. But another force almost as powerful as the economy, according to the same, to some, was the sense of chauvinism and modernism that strengthened in the midst of the Great Depression of the 1930s. Texans celebrated both the, at the centennial of Texas independence in 1936. This chauvinism but all but ignored dependence on federal coffers for surviving that depression and war years. As you read this chapter, 
considering the following questions. What social and economic impact did the Great Depression have on Texans? How did federal involvement in Texas differ during the New Deal and during World War II? Why did Texas leader appropriate a new Western image for the state, separate from its original heritage? Was this effort at rebranding more or less inclusive all of all Texans than the identity of the state's state as Southern? Why? The Great Depression. But the economy had a soft underbelly. Texas farmers, like those of other states, had suffered hard times throughout the, it, that's the seemingly prosperous decade. Farmers had not adjusted their production at the end of World War I and quickly accumulated sur surpluses that brought a sharp decline in prices in 1920 to 21. Instead of reducing production, they increased it. The number of Texas farmers farms increased from 436,038 to 495,489, and the amount of cultivated land grew by 3.5 million acres. At the same time, printed print notices of sheriff sales, business failures, and bankruptcies became characteristic of the farm country, and newspaper editors resorted to homilies. Many a family that has lost its cars, car has found its soul. Few people were aware of the nation's deeper economic problems, inequitable distribution of wealth with more, with a mere two percent of the population, controlling twenty-eight percent of the wealth, whereas the bottom sixty percent controlled about only about twenty-four percent, was only one of the harbingers of the coming difficulties. Agriculture was an industry in trouble with severe overproduction, overproduction and skewed distribution of wealth. In Texas, the heavy reliance on sharecroppers and tenant farmers embodied this problem. Texans experienced other signs of the Depression, bank failures, job losses, and industrial chaos. But economic crisis was hardly on the minds of Texans. As they went to the polls in 1928 to elect a president, Texas had its political coming out party that summer when Southern, largely unair conditioned Houston, hosted the Democratic National Convention, the first times a major national party held a convention in the South since Civil War. Southwestern booster, financier, banker, and newspaper publisher Jesse H. Jones orchestrated the efforts to locate the convention in Houston. Texas Democrats, like their counterparts throughout the South, cleaved to one version of the divided Democratic Party support for prohibition and a Protestant traditional culture. But the delegates that year nominated New York Governor Alfred E. Smith for presidency. Can, um, I'm sorry, Catholic opposed to prohibition and uh, from urban background, Smith represented everything about modernity that troubled white Texans. Moreover, he sympathized with the large immigrant population, said one Texas delegate to the convention of the celebration followed following Smith's nom nomination. I sat by the central aisle while the parade pre passed following Smith's nomination. <clears throat> And the faces I saw in that mile-long procession were not faces, American faces. I wondered where the Americans in November Texans voted on in massacre for Herbert Hoover, Hoover, the first Republican presidential candidate to carry the state. The choice was less about changing partisan identity and more about preventing cultural conflict and continuing economic prosperity. The stock market crash. Before Hoover had completed his first year in office, however, the failing economy grabbed the nation's attention in a spectacular way. The New York Stock Exchange crashed. Since the mid-1920s, the steady advance of the market encouraged many investors to speculate by purchasing stocks on margin with borrowed money. Then suddenly in September and, and October 1929, the market fell. Black Thursday. October 24th was bad, but the worst 
occurred on October 29, when 16 million shares of stock more than ever changed the hands in the, and the New York Times industrial average dropped nearly 40 points. A coalition of New York bankers tried to tried but could not stem the tide. And November exchange listings had declined on average of 37.5%. Because relatively few people in the state own stock, Texans felt insulated by, from the troubles of the market. They seemed to agree that with the editor of the Taylor Daily Press, who said that his concern was Jim Rule and Joe Normal, whom he expected would continue to do business as usual. The editor of the Houston Post-Dispatch added, the changes in stock prices are purely an affair of and for stock speculators. Governor Dan Moody finishes his, finished his term in office without feeling the full force of the coming depression or taking any action to prepare for it. Nor was the economy the chief concern of voters in the gubernatorial election of 1930, a contest that drew 11 Democrats to the race, citing his need to enter the private practice to, of law to pay his debts. Governor Moody declined to run for a third term, and Ross Sterling, a founder and former president of Humble Oil and Refining Company, carried the business progressive mantle in the campaign. Former Governor Miriam Ferguson challenged Sterling. Challenged, or I'm sorry, Sterling called for prison reform, better roads, and labor conditions, and more support for education. His service as Moody's able chair of the State Highway Commission led him to campaign a 300 to 350 million dollar bond issue for state highways. James Ferguson, who did most of the campaigning for his wife, initially did not take. Seriously, the heavy set Sterling, who had once been introduced to an audience as your fat boy from Houston, Miriam Ferguson led Sterling in the primary by more than 70,000 votes. But personalities came to the, to the fore as she and Sterling met in the runoff, where Fergusonum, Ferganism was the issue. Said one Sterling insider, the issue now was honest and responsible government versus dishonest and proxy government. The added influence of former Governor Moody and other officials who announced for Sterling and began making speeches on his behalf pushed him to victory. The depression deepens. The election was, however, a sideshow to the main event as cotton prices continued to fall and unemployment soared. The Hoover administration offered little more than the appearance of action, an endless series of meetings, each of which seemed to culminate with hollow statements of confidence that, I'm sorry, that prosperity is just around the corner. The optimism continued into 1931 with the Fort Worth Star-Telegram, for example, claiming that Texans did not know what hard times are, unquote, and pointing to increased construction, railroad traffic and oil production, and stable cattle and poultry sales. Even as late as 1933, Jones, the Houston banker whom President Hoover had appointed to the board of the Reconstruction Finance Corporation, told a Dallas audience, the most important thing before the nation today is to balance the budget, unquote. In Temple, Meanwhile, the impact of the Wall Street crash came in 1930, sooner than anyone had accept, expected, when the local banks began to lay off experienced employees. Banks throughout the state struggled with bank runs and closures. As in the, result, the rest of the United States, the majority of bank failures occurred in small towns. For example, in December 1931, there were 113 fewer banks operating in Texas than in the year previous. Deposits declined by over $200 million between Black Thursday and 1932. More than 5,000 banks failed and 100,000 businesses closed nationwide. And the national income was halved by 80, from $80 billion to $40 billion. The human cost was tremendous with an increase in the murder rate, the suicide rate, 
and the number of hospitalizations for mental treatment, health treatment during the Depression years. Lost bank accounts translated into lost homes and businesses and changed modes of living. As early as January 1930, labor unions officers asked San Antonio officials to vote bonds to provide work for the growing number of unemployed construction workers in Houston. A local news vendor reported that the, his business was up because he, who don't like they have much more than the price of a newspaper in their pockets are buying them now to read the want ads unquote by 1931 over 350,000 Texans were unemployed the results of the crash for women and people of color were worse than for white men new oil softened the blow in a few a few places such as Taylor and Kilgore but in Midland oil prices crashed because of overproduction in the East Texas field which led to declining leases and drilling and rising employment. The population of Midland dropped by approximately 1,000 to between 1930 and 1932. By 1933, more than 7% of Texas families were on relief compared to 10% nationally. The rate in, in Texas increased to about 13% the following year. Some historians have suggested that rural Texas did not suffer as much as city dwellers because they had gardens and continued to raise much of their food. But as the economy faltered, the average wage per paid for the backbreaking labor of picking cotton dropped from 1.21 per 100 pounds in 1928 to 44 cents in 1931. But then farmers had other concerns as well. I did not go to church tonight. Well, William G. DeLoach of Crosby County in the Texas Panhandle recorded in his diary in 1931. Quote, I'm afraid to go. That is, all of us go away at night. Some people are losing their canned goods. We have quite a lot of foods of different kinds canned up. Can't afford to take the chance on some road tramp coming here and getting it, so I stayed home, unquote. Family and friends initially rallied to help those who fell victim to unemployment, and when their resources were expended, private charities helped out. When charitable funds were depleted and only the local and state governments remained to help, some cities, some cities established public works programs to offer temporary aid to the unemployed, but usually tried to limit to it to local residents. Midland and other cities sent police officers to train stations to make sure that transients got back on their train. Houston, meanwhile, denied relief to African Americans and Mexican Americans prior to 1933. <laughs> Mexican and Mexican Americans suffered from the federal government's policy repartition, which began in 1928 and increased during the, the Hoover administration, a misleading term since many of the Mexican heritage people returned to Mexico during the Depression, were American born U.S. citizens. Approximately 500,000 Mexican heritage people were re repartated to Mexico during the Great Depression, with half from Texas. In Texas, the peak year of the year of the repartition initiative was 1931. Though some repartees came from urban Texas, the depression in agriculture was the most important reason for this movement. Ironically, many of the repartees left the substantial substantial resources because many policymakers saw Mexican heritage residents of the United States as temporary. Then Congressman John Nance Garner said Mexicans were like homing pigeons. They would readily return to their home country. They saw nothing wrong with the repatriation policy. Actually, rep repatriation was the just as temporary for it provided only a brief halt to the movement of Mexican migrants into the United States. 
Anglo-Texans sometimes behaved violently toward the Mexican heritage population, remaining in the state the headquarters of the Society of Mexican Laborers located in Mo Molokov, Texas, was bombed and the Mexican Consul General in San Antonio told Governor Sterling, quote, there is, an, is intense excitement and fear among Mexican nationals of serious bodily injury, unquote. The depression had min multiple meanings for Texas women. In 1930, one third of Texas women worked outside the home, typically in jobs designated for the women. The modernization of the state and the national nation encouraged farm women, especially girls coming of age, to move off the farm and into the cities. Historian Rebecca Sharpless noted, once a family member left home, she often developed into a different person, shedding her old rural appearance and taking on new urban values, unquote. The intrusion of the Depression exaggerated this process while also forcing urban Texas women to learn new modes of survival. Anglos used the Depression to mitigate against the efforts of minority women to improve their economic circumstances. Historian Monica Perellis noted, El Paso's elites were able to counter the unionization efforts of Mexican-American domestic workers by either hiring Mexican women from across the border or structuring relief requirements in such a way that American-born Mexicans had no choice but to accept the miserable paying jobs as maids, unquote. Middle-class women became the target as local businesses and political leaders implicitly and explicitly suggested women's behavior and choices had exasperated the depression. For middle-class women, a typical, quote, buy at home, unquote, campaign, such as the one in Austin, urged women to talk Austin, write about Austin, work for Austin, and live for Austin, unquote. Some school districts refused to pay, refused to employ single women, and on the assumption of only one breadwinner per family, fired married women if their spouse had a job. The school board in San Antonio ordered that married women with husbands earning over $2,000 a year should be fired. In some communities, there simply was no more money. In such circumstances, school districts and retail merchant associations issued script as circulating medium the depression became so severe that only the federal government stood between the country and complete collapse the dust bowl even if the depression did take longer to arrive in texas than in other parts of the country it was no less devastating conditions on the farm got even worse as it as it as a combination of poor land maintenance and a devastating drought created what became known as the Dust Bowl of the Great Plains. Growing numbers of enthusiastic young farmers had moved into the plains since the turn of the century, and in just a few years, although through cattle raising and row crop agriculture, they had destroyed most of the native grasses that held the dirt in place. Between 1925 and 1930, with the new gasoline tractors, entrepreneurs plowed up the vegetation on millions of acres of the Southern Plains in what one writer has called the Great Plow Up, unquote. The rain stopped abruptly in late 1931, and one of the periodic droughts that played the plague, the semi-arid region, is set in and lasted through 1934. But this was not an ordinary drought, with almost 33 million acres of plains, land bare and open to the characteristically high winds, with the phenomenon known as the Dust Bowl began. The onset of a polar air mass that might, in an ordinary year, have produced common sand blows, now incited black blizzards that were sometimes accompanied by fantastic displays of lightning. Atmospheric electricity lifted the wind-blown dirt as high as 7,000 to 8,000 feet until it looked at like a winter blizzard or huge thunderstorm. 1932, the Soil Conservation Service counted 14 dust storms 
on the plains. That number increased to 38 in 1933, fell to 22 in 1934, rose again in 1935, 68 in 1936, and 72 in 1937, the worst year on record. The storm of, 18, uh, of April 1935 was the worst as it blew in on April 9th. William DeLouch recorded the visibility fell to 200 to 300 yards. His family remained in the house for several days. On Sunday, while the rest of the family was at church and he sat reading, the worst of the storm hit. One could hardly get breath. He wrote, I thought I would choke when I went to bed. Even in Austin, legislators and staff were gauze face wore gauze face masks in the Capitol. Thousands of tenants and sharecroppers and even some landowners gave up and left. <clears throat> Many joined the exodus to California, attracted that John Steinbeck made famous in his novel, novel The Grapes of Wrath, 1939. But a large number of the Dust Bowl migrants were not, victim, <clears throat> not victims of drought, windstorm, and grasshoppers. A number of them were tenants who had been forced off the land by tractors and wage laborers. Others had been replaced by Mexican laborers. Those not returned to Mexico under the reportation policy, who had been immigrating northward and increasing numbers since the turn of the century and were willing to work for less. The net result was a reduction of almost 200,000 in the number of people living on farms in Texas between 1930 and 1940. Even in the face of such tragedies, Governor Sterling apparently agreed with the Hoover administration that his responsibility as governor was to reduce the state's expenses. He vetoed a number of bills passed by the 42nd legislator, usually because they did not provide taxes to cover their costs. Despite the fact that the legislator met for 131 days, little was done to assist in the state's crisis during what was characterized as a, quote, do-nothing session. This pay-as-you-go approach was traditional in Texas. Chaos in East Texas oil field. Sterling's greatest concerns were the state's two largest economic engines, oil and agriculture. And ironically, overproduction was the problem in both cases. By 1930, oil had been discovered all over Texas and the new wells in the Yates... Yeah. Yates Field in West Texas were so productive that many industry experts began to warn of overproduction. Then in the na October 1930, Columbus Marion, Dad Joyner, brought in the Daisy Bradford number no. three near Kilgore, and the East Texas boom was on. The East Texas field was even bigger than Spindle Top. Within two years, it boasted more than 10,000 producing wells, and the price of oil fell from a little over a dollar a barrel in 1930 to $0.08 cents a barrel in 1931. In the peak year of 1933, the East Texas production reached 204,954,000 barrels of oil, more than the rest of the, the state combined. The East Texas field was an anomaly for at least two reasons. The first was its sheer size. Within a few months of Joyner's discovery, successful wells had been drilled into his this huge reservoir in five counties spread over 140,000 acres. Experts estimated that it contained about 5.5 billion barrels of oil, approximately one third of the nation's then known oil reserves. The second anomaly, the absence of major oil companies brought a new element in the industry into the industry. This field became known as the promised land of independent producers and small royalty owners. And they, along with entrepreneurs, swindlers, prostitutes, hustlers of all kinds, gathered around the oil field workers in Kilgore, the center of the most act of the activity. When the wildcatters realized that they were not drilling in separate fields, as they had thought, 
but into the into one giant pool the frenzy began the earnest the role of capture the law governing of the development of oil fields <clears throat> ever since a pennsylvania supreme court decision in 1889 meant that the person who pumped the oil owned it even if it had migrated from an adjoining lease landowners began to sell leases that were measured in feet rather than acres send and ultimately one city block in kilgore contained 44 wells the massive overproduction soon forced the price of oil down and kept it down as the unusual circumstances of this particular field ensured that everyone would continue to drill and pump as fast as they could no one would agree to limit production unless they all did Governor Sterling still first suggested that the Railroad Commission Act under the authority granted by the legislature in 1917. This small state regulatory agency, though, did not have the capacity to control the massive East Texas field, and the problem was not easily resolved. Conservationists and the major oil companies criticized unrestrained production as a wasteful of natural resources and as a threat to the very existence of the east texas field by reducing the internal pressure that made the oil flow the independent producers refused to stop pumping because their survival was at stake most of them were operating on a shoestring budget or on a bar on borrowed money and slowing down or stopping would have meant bankruptcy Second, they suspected the motives of the major producers whose reserves would diminish significantly in value if the price of oil remained low. The independents argued that such restrictions were not for the sake of conservation, but were in fact illegal price fixing. The Railroad Commission initially ordered production limit limited to about a thousand barrels per day at each well but a federal court struck down the order on the grounds that it was price fixing through three special sessions in the summer of 1931. the legislature was unable to reach a solution in the meantime the ma major producers who owned the refineries stopped buying east texas oil claiming that they did not re need it the independents re established tea kettle refineries and their own gasoline stations finally with more than a million barrels of oil a day pouring from the east texas field an agreement among the operators apparently not possible governor sterling declared martial law in four counties and sent in the national guard the fact that he was a former president of humble oil and that the national guard commander in the field General Jacob E. Walters was an attorney for the Texas company, gave the independent grounds to doubt the state's objectivity in the matter. The hot oil is that, that is, oil produced in violation of the Railroad Commission's orders continue to flow and the secrecy required to circumvent the national guard also made it extremely difficult to determine the amount of oil produced who owned it and whether correct royalties were being paid in another special session in the fall of 1932 the legislature authorized the railroad commission to prorate production according to market demands and in 1932 at the request of Ernest O. Thompson, chair of the Railroad Commission, the governor sent a force of Texas Rangers to stop the flow of hot oil. The chaos in the East Texas field was the immediate impetus for Roosevelt, Secretary of the, the Interior, Harold Licks, I'm sorry, Harold Ikes, to propose federal control of the oil industry as he saw it. The first, the price of oil needed to be higher in the interest of the, of the country, financials, financial recovery. So the unchecked flow of hot oil constituted a problem for the country as well as the industry. His efforts at federal control were met 
with fierce resistance, particularly among <clears throat> the independent oil producers whose point of view was well represented by the Texas congressional delegation. Because the state had retained title to its public lands upon joining the Union, Texas had a credible argument to make against interference by the federal government. Ultimately, a begrudging Texas accepted as little federal assistance as it could get away with to educate the lawlessness and in the East Texas field only because the Texas Railroad Commission could not alone control the situation. By 1933, the Rangers had, a, had restored some measure of order to the East Texas field. And in January 1934, a federal court upheld the Railroad Commission's right to, prefer, to prorate oil production. But it was not until later that year, with the establishment of a federal oversight board and the threat of prison, that the flow of hot oil declined sharply. When the Supreme Court declared unconstitutional the National Recovery Administration, under whose auspices the federal government had acted, Texas Senator Tom Connolly sponsored the Connolly Hot Oil Act of 1935, specifically to make interstate transportation of hot oil illegal. Within a few years, most of the small independents had sold out to the stronger, better capitalized major producers who owned 80% of the East Texas field by the time World War II broke out. Later in the country, in the century, when the Organization of Petroleum Ex Exporting Countries, o OPEC, nations were struggling to control their own overproduction, they found their model for stabilizing the international price of oil in the Texas Railroad Commission. Sterling had dealt successfully with the East Texas oil crisis, but in doing so, he had alienated large numbers of East Texas voters. Agricultural overproduction. Sterling's other problem grew out of the continuing agricultural depression. The price of cotton, already low at 9 to 10 cents per pound in 1930, fell drastically in 1931 bottoming out at around five cents per pound that fall. The prices of other commodities fell as well, but not as much. The net result was that farmers' purchasing power was about one-third of what it had been before World War I. The problem would not have been as severe if Texas farmers had been more diversified or if it had voluntarily limited production. They had tried several different marketing cooperatives, including the Federal Farm Board and the Texas Marketing Association, both of which failed in the face of the 1931 crop of more than 17 billion million bales of cotton nationally, 5.32 million in Texas, the second largest in history. Any action to limit Texas cotton produ producers would have collapsed without the cooperation of the co of other cotton producing states. So in response to a joint resolution of the legislature, Sterling called for a governor's conference for the summer of 1931 to try to come up with a plan for a unified action. Five states sent representatives who agreed to limit cotton production. Texas would during one of the special sessions of 1931. The legislature passed a law limiting the 1932 cotton acreage to 30% of the 1931 crop. A few days later, the courts held it to be unconstitutional. The 1932 yield in Texas alone was 4.5 million bales. Ferguson revived. James Ferguson, an astute and veteran observer of the political scene, concluded that the 1932 could be a good Ferguson year, and Miriam Ferguson filed to run against Sterling, along with seven other candidates, as 
always with Ferguson's personalities rather than issues, seem to inspire the voters. The Fergusons accuse the wealthy Sterling of trying to buy the election, misusing the highway fund, and employing political allies in the highway department. Sterling alleged they committed voter fraud, and probably with reason. The Ferguson strongholds of East Texas issued only 359,667 poll tax receipts, but reported that 397,386 votes were cast in the July primary. Sterling lost the runoff by fewer than 4,000 votes. Efforts to investigate voter tampering were thwarted. Ferguson gained a second term as governor. Marion Ferguson accomplished little during her second term because the legislator was wary of all proposals that she presented and because the efforts of newly elected President Franklin Delano Roosevelt to deal with the Depression overshadowed the preempted st state actions. She did support the new president, telling him that after he took the nation off the gold standard, I congratulate you upon the idea to abolish the gold standard. Your action is fully justified because the Shylocks have sought to collect a dollar which they did not loan. I mean that they loaned a bank check and now seek to collect a gold dollar. Ferguson resumed her policy to liberally pardoning prisoners and turned the Texas Rangers into a form of political patronage by appointing 2,344 special rangers, unquote. Plans to consolidate state agencies and reorganize the state's higher education system failed. The 21st Amendment to the U.S. Constitution, which repealed the, U the 18th Amendment and once again left the management of alcoholic beverages up to the state and local officials, was ratified in December of 1933. But Texas did not repeal its prohibition amendment until August 1935. Essentially, the Depression had overwhelmed local, state, and private efforts, and with the election of Roosevelt in 1932, Texas, along with the rest of the nation, penned its hopes for recovery on the federal government. The New Deal. We now, uh, we know in hindsight that no president could have prevented the Depression or quickly returned the nation to prosperity. But President Hoover's lackluster personality and political indebtedness made him a scapegoat. And Texas was, were ready to return to the Democratic fold in 1932. Truly, I have been hard, one pen penitent voter wrote. But I deserve no sympathy. I voted for Hoover when Speaker of the U.S. House of Representatives John Glantz, Nance Garner of Uvalde accepted second second place on the ticket with Roosevelt that sealed the deal as far as Texans were concerned. More than 88% of the te state Texas support supported Roosevelt and Garner in their call for a new deal for the American people. Texas in Washington. With Garner as vice president for the and de facto of header of Texas delegation, the state was well positioned within the federal government. Some historians consider Garner to have been the most powerful vice president in history because his former Speaker of the House, who knew virtually every legislator personality, personally, he wielded enormous influence. Sam Rayburn, the congressman from Bonham, Bonham and Garner's longtime associate and protege had the uh, headed the Institute Interstate and Foreign Commerce Committee. Rayburn shepherded through Congress important legislation to regulate Wall Street. Roosevelt elevated Hoover appointee Jesse Jones to the chair of the Reconstruction Finance Corporation, RFC, which soon became one of the most powerful agencies in Washington. Congress structured the RFC as an independent agency, but in reality, it was a government bank that made loans, received repayment of loans, and earned interest and from time to time added to its capital. The RFC funded some of the most significant New Deal agencies, but perhaps the most important thing it did 
was save the banking system itself by purchasing preferred stock in threatened banks. Of course, Jones gained support in Congress by funding a pet project on occasion, but his real source of power was Garner and the Texas delegation who usually stood united on the important issues. By January 1936, the RFC had to Dispersed more than $8 billion, received $3.2 billion, and earned $294 million in interest. The Federal Agent Emergency Relief Administration provided funds for direct reliefs as well as work relief. Because of the requirement of that the state governments share the burden, Texans had to amend the 1876 Constitution so that the state could provide $20 million in matching bread bonds, unquote, to feed the hungry. Other programs provided jobs. The Civilian Conservation <clears throat> Corps, the National Youth Administration, NYA, directed in Texas for a, for a while by the young Lyndon B. Johnson, the Public Works Administration, and the Works Progress Administration, WPA, Employed thousands of Texans, Johnson's NYA was one of the more progressive in the nation, employing over nineteen thousand dollars or nineteen thousand. I'm sorry, young African Americans in ways that did not attract publicly or criticism. Aubrey Williams, the national director of the NYA, and Johnson did a beautiful job and rated the Texas efforts as one of the very best in the country. He fought for those kids to get them all he could. He even fought for, he even fought me to get things and money for them, unquote. His efforts encourage, helped encourage African Americans to shift political loyalties away from the Republican Party and toward the Democratic Party, even though other New Deal agencies were much less helpful to minorities. The federal dollars went for relief, civic construction projects, and culture. Interviewers paid by the federal government documented the lives of literally thousands of Texans, former slaves, old cowboys, Indians, and pioneer res residents in all parts of the state, and federally funded artists painted and sculptured sculpted historically based public work artworks for courthouses and pub post offices throughout the state. Over 65 Texas post offices became more home to almost 100 murals in the massive public art project unleashed during the New Deal. The great Mexican muralist, including Diego Rivers, inspired these paintings, which depicted settlement narratives Industrial development and ranching culture, folk heroes, cowboys, and American Indians all told the federal government through public works and relief programs invested some $351,023,546 in Texas between 1933 and 1936. State and local funds provided another $80 million dollars. $80,268,595 in assistance. Unfortunately, many of the poor received little help. Programs that encouraged lower production in an effort to forestall sinking prices for the farmer drove up the cost for of food for the consumer, making it difficult for those below the poverty line to maintain an adequate diet. Mexican-American and African-American families were among those who suffered the most. Programs that rewarded owners for taking land out of production and mechanizing their farms drove tenants off the land. Meanwhile, the high, although a higher percentage of African-American workers were on relief than white workers, African-Americans in Houston received 25% less per month than whites under the New Deal programs. Some relief agencies place African-American workers only in unskilled jobs and others would not hire them at all. These agencies also denied, also denied ethnic Mexicans work on the grounds that they were not citizens. 1934, Texas Attorney General James 
the fifth all red campaign for governor by identifying with Roosevelt and the New Deal. Although conservative criticism of the presidential of the president and his programs had begun to sur surface, Roosevelt still had the support of a huge majority of Texans, and Allred had who had come to public attention as an opponent of out-of-state monopolies and political lobbies, probably had better name recognition than any of his opponents after Miriam Ferguson declined to run. As she said, because of the two-term tradition, the evangelical Alfred attracted attention, one Houston reporter likening him to an actor with expert political and or radical skills. Nevertheless, his call for public utilities commission, restriction on lobbies, and a modest tax on chain stores to limit out-of-state competition did not rouse large numbers of voters. A reporter for the Austin Statesman claimed that most voters had responded with a wide yawn. Allred still won the race, defeating his main opponent, Tom Hunter, an independent oil man who he charged had made a corrupt bargain to gain the Ferguson support. This will be the end of Chapter 12, Part 1. Thank you.